Okay. <laughs> trying to reconnect. You know what? That's the story of my life sometimes, trying to reconnect. Y'all ever been there? Anyway, I do apologize for, for the lateness. Uh, got here and the printer's not working now. Blame me. Pinned down somewhere. I don't know what I did with it. Okay. You get mine? Here it is. See, if I got up, I'd have found it. Thank you. Anyway, uh, let's stop right now before we go any further. And let's pray that this rain comes here. It's raining hard in Benton County. All right, I talked to Becky as I was pulling in. So let's stop right now and let's pray that prayer. Jay, lead us, please. Amen. Thank you. I called Becky when I was on the way in from Scott and Michelle's. And, Is it raining here? And she said, it's pouring down. I said, well, it looks like it could rain here, but we're going to pray that it does. All right. I want to thank everybody again for being here. Uh, I want to thank Brother Joel for taking care of things while we were away on our, our vacation. And uh, I want to thank our ladies. You always go above and beyond. And sometimes almost overboard when you think, but there's never, never any doubt that people are going to be fed. And, and I know they appreciate it. And speaking of that, this Sunday is last Sunday, so it's eating Sunday. So let's just do it all again. And, and answer to Ronnie's question, no, we won't preach on gluttony, all right? Uh, it is Youth Sunday. But since I'm going to be gone Sunday night, Brother Joel's going to preach Sunday night, and I'm going to preach Sunday morning. We'll be in Hebrews 11 somewhere. I was going to preach on Abel, but I might preach on verse 6 and then come back to Abel next week. Too much good stuff in verse 6 to leave out, all right? But anyway, been working on it. It's been a busy week. So far this week, I've preached three funerals and worked two. So this is only Wednesday. But I appreciate you all reaching out to uh, Scott Scott, Ramsey, and his family and the loss of his sister. And it was a nice service. Thank you for all your help, Sandy. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts tomorrow night. Let me look at the times there. Where does it say the times? 6.30. That's what I thought, but I couldn't see it. Of course, I don't have my glasses on. That. Six. Correction, 6 to 8. Those of you who are listening, 6 o'clock, all right? Uh, last Sunday lunch this week, also Youth Sunday. Uh, church camp is August 1st through 5th. That begins Monday at Camp Siloam. And on September the 4th, we're going to do a promotion Sunday for those that are moving up into the next class. Some of us won't move up. Uh, we way past that. But also, we want to recognize our... Uh, educators in our church, those that are working in public and private education. Any other announcements? Yeah, I want to mention, if you are still interested in going to the Tim Hawkins concert in Springdale, you need to let Brother Joel know. If you just like good Christian humor, you'll like Tim Hawkins. Uh, he, uh, If you look him up on YouTube, he rewrote a song to the tune of the Beatles yesterday, you know, yesterday. Only it's about Chick-fil-A. It's good. It's good. Chick-fil-A is a very Christian organization. I don't know if you know that. All right, let's go over our prayer list. Any other announcements? All right, let's go over our prayer list together. Uh, I've, been, I've been playing catch-up all week from having been gone and uh, still haven't caught up. But I'm going to give you the people that I know about, give you some updates on people I know about, and then if you have any that you want to, mention or you want to put it on uh, Facebook. Hopefully I can see it from where I am. If not, maybe somebody else can see it. But uh, I didn't know until earlier this week, I talked to Brother Joel and uh, 
Brother Danny Beard, who's pastor at Calvary Baptist Church, is on our prayer list. I didn't know what's going on, but we certainly need to pray for him. Keep praying for Les Pinkerton. Uh, I noticed Tandy's on our prayer list. Okay, thank you. Uh, Murray family, uh, Valentine family, uh, pray for all of those families. Uh, I talked to Judy yesterday and talked to Hugh this afternoon. Hugh got an excellent pathology report. Very thankful for that. The doctor feels confident that he got it all and there won't be any repercussions. But uh, anyway, they're very, do what? All right, that's good. That's good. Glad to hear that. But he wanted to thank you all for your prayers again. Keep praying for Sarah Page Lee. She's still having complications from knee surgery. Uh, the Little John family. I knew I was leaving out one. Couldn't think of them. I want to mention Rick Neal. Rick is still at uh, Mayo in uh, Phoenix. And they're going to do a heart ablation pretty soon. But they're still doing some research on what area they need to work on. And they're very particular before they start. They want to know exactly. And, of course, we're talking Mayo. But uh, pray for Rick and, and Heath and all that family. All right, if you will. Pray for my aunt and cousin, Shirley and Billy Wilson. Keep playing for Donna Spears, uh, Marie Roy. Uh, she was placed on hospice, and I haven't received an update recently, and maybe maybe somebody will, will, will update us on, on her. Uh, Tom Teehee, any work? There you are. Okay, see what the procedure will be, okay. A lot of other people on the prayer list, but who do you want to mention tonight or update? Anyone? Oh, sorry. Ronnie Allen? All right, we'll add Ronnie Allen. But there's praise to that. Yes, I was going to say there's a really cool story. Okay. It was really bad. Yeah. No, Monday or Tuesday night. And my mom called me, but didn't think he was going to make it. She didn't think he was going to make it to the hospital. We got to the hospital, and he was in the parents, and he kept saying, I need my nephew, which is his name, Jimmy. He's my name, Jimmy. I've got to talk to Jimmy. So, Really? Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. For those of you watching on Facebook Live couldn't hear, this this is Janet's uncle. He's in the hospital, incoherent, asked for a family member to come. And when the family member got here, he wasn't incoherent in the morning he was saved. So praise the Lord. Yeah. I love hearing stories like that. That's good. If it wasn't bad this week at Shout. Marquita Mason. Okay, remember the Mason family. Who else? Okay, thank you. We do too in our family, please. I notice Brother Albert's watching. Still keep praying for him, please. Miss Carolyn's not feeling well. Uh, there's an upper respiratory going around that's not COVID. We've had it at our house. We both got sick when we were uh, down in Florida and Alabama. And finally, I went to the doctor, and Becky's going tomorrow. But anyway, they put me on good stuff. Got an antibiotic, and I got uh, prednisone. Boy, I love that drug, don't y'all? I hate that medicine, boy. Makes you feel like you just... <laughs> I won't sleep a wink tonight. I'll end up on the couch from tossing and turning, I'm sure. But it's drying it up. Anyone else? Oh, okay. Sandra Morgan, where's that service? Okay. All right. Remember this family in your prayers. Anyone else? All right. If all minds are clear, uh, I, once again, I apologize for us having started late, but we're here now. 
And in a minute, we're going to open our Bibles to Romans chapter 12. We're making progress. All right. So let's bow together and please pray over these. Brother B, to lead our prayer on behalf of these, please, sir. Thank you for the day. Thank you for letting us be here tonight. Lord, we pray for these that have been mentioned tonight that uh, requested that a prayer from us. Lord, I ask that you would hear us and that you would grant your request. Be a little bit of even as we pray for the ones that have unspoken requests and that we grant those for you your will. So that you bless families that have lost something. Bless our time together tonight. Open your word to us. Let us understand it. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you got a copy of the outline. It's front and back, I'm pretty sure. Did y'all get one? Okay, good. When we printed it first, Joel, Joel forgot to make it do front and back, so there were two pages. That's always confusing to us. Anyway, I'm going to put my ink pen down. Becky watches and she says, you fidget with that ink pen sometimes when you're talking, so I'm not going to do that anymore. Romans 12. When you get to chapter 8, and then you start in 9, and we mentioned this when we went 9, 10, and 11. 9, 10, 11 kind of formed a break. I would call it a parenthetical clause. It all had to do about the Jews and Paul's passion for the salvation of the Jews. But not only did it tell us about that, I'm grateful and thankful to God for His almighty grace. It also tells us that God's not finished with Israel and the Jews yet. Uh, we, we, we know about that. So this, this last section of the book begins in chapter number 12. And Paul kind of goes back to where he first began. He spent considerable time, first six chapters, telling us why we needed to be saved, how to be saved, uh, a surety of salvation when you get into chapter 8. And, and we kind of get back to this. But this goes beyond the realm of our salvation but it's a part of it. Excuse me. It has to do with righteous living. Holy living. I want to say this tonight. It's not in my notes. not in yours anywhere. We Baptists probably don't talk about that as much as we should. Other denominations who do not believe in eternal security are more adamant, more preachy about living a more godly life. And I think sometimes we just kind of lean on on our flesh as a crutch and say, well, I'm saved. And I don't think we say that audibly, but it becomes a part of us. I, I'm grateful and thankful that we have a home awaiting us in heaven. I'm glad that I'll live someday in a perfect mansion that was prepared just for me. And I know a lot of the newer translation says, there are many rooms there. They can have a room if they want to. I'm going to get me a mansion, all right? I'd rather it be a cabin out in the edge of the woods somewhere, but it'll be great, whatever it is, all right? But right now, and we're referred to this in Scripture, we are strangers and pilgrims on this earth. There was a great writer years ago, and he wrote a book about that, and, and he talked about how for this journey we're on, we need to make sure we pack lightly. Uh, and and, and there's, there, there's profound truth in that. And, and when you think about it, this is temporary. I mean, we live our lives for this life, but sometimes we forget that there's a better life awaiting us. I was thankful that three and a half weeks ago, Scott's sister was, she admitted her salvation while we were in ICU together. And I don't know if she got saved that day or when, but she knew she was saved. And she's going to heaven. A lot of you are priest at funeral when you know that person went to heaven. And that was their testimony. But anyway, the first, the first two verses of chapter 12 give us some insight into an area of our walk with God that we don't need to overlook. And I hate to say these verses give us a secret to holy living because that almost sounds like it's a formula. All right? But dare say probably... Most of you in here tonight, and a lot of you listening, can quote, quote Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I remember when I started memorizing Scripture as a boy at Daddy's insistence. It wasn't just, this is what I want you to do. He made us memorize Scripture. And looking back, 
I'm very thankful to God that he did. It came in handy later on. And I wish my memory was as good as it used to be because y'all don't know it, but sometimes I'll be preaching and I'll try to quote a verse and I can't think of it. And I could blame that on old age, but I think it's just a miles, all right? But anyway, let's read this and we're going to talk tonight about the worship of God. When you read this, you may not get that from the wording in the King James Bible, but we're going to delineate and make these words a little more plain. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Paul says, I beseech you therefore. Let me stop right there and go back to the last verse of chapter 11. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. What a great doxology. What is the therefore, therefore? Based on that, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. What's the mercies of God? Another word for God's grace, God's benefits to us. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. When we hear that, we don't fully understand it because we weren't accustomed to the Jewish Levitical system. But we'll, we'll talk about that more. A living sacrifice holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not, do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to stop right here and say, if anybody's listening tonight, whether present or on Facebook Live, and you are searching for God's will, most of us in our flesh want to play games with God. We want to say, God, if you'll show me what you want me to do, I'll do it. Yeah, let's make a deal, Brother Darren said. Very good. I'm, I'll try to remember that. I probably won't, all right? But we say, Lord, if you'll tell me what you want me to do, I'll do it. But God doesn't work that way. God says we're supposed to hand him a blank sheet of paper, sign the bottom of it, and hand it to him and say, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. That is what the gist of this verse is, all right? That way we prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's talk about the worship of God. Notice the wording of verse 1. Paul tells us that yielding our bodies to the Lord is reasonable service. The word reasonable comes from the same word that we get our word logic from. So we think, well, it's reasonable, but it really means it's logical. So from a human vantage point, we're His. We'll talk about this in this study. He bought us. He purchased us, all right? He has full ownership over us. So it would be a logical conclusion to say that we would yield our bodies to the Lord. That's what the word reasonable means. Then the word service comes from a word which means to perform sacred service. And it has in mind the work of the priest inside the tabernacle and the temple. The, the priest and the Levites, all right? So a lot of that is back to the Old Testament. Yeah, I mean, I mean, these, these, these readers, these hearers, they're, they're grasping this. We, we don't grasp it because we're not accustomed to that Levitical form of worship, all right? So it is connected to the idea of worship. And by the way, that's what the word, your reasonable service, literally means an act of worship. So presenting our bodies to Him as a living sacrifice is our reasonable, logical worship. We don't think about worship in that sense, all right? But we don't bring a lamb or a bull or some other animal to the temple or to the tabernacle, hand it to the priest, and offer it, say, as a sin offering, all right? And the priest takes that animal, he inspects it for blemishes, it's got to be just right, and then what does he do with it? First off, he sheds its blood. And then he cuts it up, he offers it on the brazen altar to God. Uh, there are offerings that they, the priest and the Levites, were able to take 
their portion of food out of it. And if you'll remember, Hophni and Phinehas were, were taking a whole lot more than belonged to them. And that's one of the things that, that got Eli in trouble because he didn't raise his children right. <coughs> so the idea, you bring that animal to the temple, let's say. The priests take that animal. What do you do when they take it? You don't hang on to it and pull back and say, it's mine, I don't want to get rid of it. What do you do? You take your hands off of it. It's not yours anymore. All right? You've given it to God as an offering. Brother Darren says I need to preach on tithing. All right? Well, we'll get there when the Lord says to. All right? So... Here's what I want you to get from, from all that, all right? When we are yielded to Him, the highest form of worship that we can render is presenting ourselves to Him, not as a sacrifice that's about to die, but as a living sacrifice. One writer that I read after said, Nothing says... I love you, Lord, more than a consecrated, dedicated life. Okay? So let's talk about the challenge of this. Uh, when Paul says to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, and, and, and once again, we don't see ourselves walking up and laying down on the old wooden altar and saying, here I am, Lord, all of me, all that I am, all that I have is yours. With the exception of my pocketbook. With the exception of my thought life. With the exception of things I say in private. Now, I'm preaching a little bit now, ain't I? All right? But, but, but sometimes the point is we hold back. We don't take our hands off. We don't fully present ourselves. And it means to place at someone else's disposal. Like I said, when those temple and tabernacle worshipers brought their sacrifices, the priest examined it, they laid it on the brazen offer, they took their hands off of it. And when we present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice, we take our hands off of it. I, I want to tell you all something. And I don't want you to think that I'm bragging because I'm not, because I'm ashamed of the time that I wasted running from the calling of God on my life. I didn't want to be a preacher. It was the last thing in the world I wanted to be. I liked preachers. Well, some of them I didn't like, but most of the preachers we had, I, I, I liked them. We connected with them. That's back in the day where every Sunday, you know, you went to somebody's house or they came to yours, and, and preachers were always welcome in our home. And I think I can feasibly tell this story now and if my aunt's listening you'll understand Aunt Shirley but my dad surrendered to preach when I was a little boy <coughs> and looking back I mean I was too young I barely have one faint memory of standing up in a pew and my dad being in the pulpit but mom told me about it as I grew older but he was basically talked into being a preacher by a preacher we call that being preacher called but he surrendered his life, quit his job. We left Pampa, Texas and moved to Lubbock, Texas, which happiness is Lubbock, Texas in your rear view mirror, as the song said, okay? And there was a Bible college there that was an extension of Jacksonville Baptist College in Jacksonville, Texas. And some, some great men of God taught there. So dad's working full time at night and going to Bible college in the day. And... and that less than a year that we lived there because that was my sister's first grade year in school. And dad worked in the oil patch in Texas and we moved a lot. She went to five different first grades, first grade schools in first grade. Between moving from Pampa to Borger, Borger, Borger to Pampa, Pampa to Lubbock, and Lubbock back to Pampa, all right? Five different first grades. I'm glad I wasn't in school yet because I wouldn't have went to school, I promise, all right? But a lot of trauma in our lives, a lot of problems, and Dad finally decided that he wasn't called to preach. So he, he renounced his call to ministry, and he handed his license back into the church that licensed him. But there was always a whisper 
in our family about when Monroe made that mistake. That's the way it was called. Oh, he made a mistake. So I grew up being exposed to that. Made a mistake. My biggest fear was I was going to make a mistake. And to me, because of what I'd heard and what I'd been exposed to, that was a bad thing. Well, I want to tell you, I don't think it would be a mistake for somebody to believe they were called to ministry and to set out to do it and to decide they weren't. At least they were seeking God's will. At least they put their all on the altar and said, Lord, if this is where you want me to use me, use me, God. Sorry I got preachy about that. But like I said, that's a little personal to me. So it means that we're not holding anything back from God. We've taken our hands off. And I, I held back, and I wouldn't take my hands off. And I, when you're not running with God, you're running away from Him. You ain't doing good things. And I'm ashamed of the life I lived during that three to four year time frame. So the idea here is total surrender to God. That's why I called it a challenge. That's a challenge. That's a challenge for us. You know why? Because we're human. There's areas of our life we want to hang on to. I, I counsel with people all the time. And they said, Brother Paul, I've got this issue. Well, it's, a, it's an issue. It's an area of their life they never gave to God. And, and people struggle with habits and, 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 and things like that. And, and they, they've never given it to God. And it, it's difficult. I know we're dealing with our flesh here. And by the way, your flesh will cooperate with you with anything you want it to do. Anything your, your lustful mind can come up with. Your flesh will cooperate with you, all right? Because the Bible says the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Because they are contrary to one another. So there's a battle going on. It's a spiritual battle. Well, anybody got a comment? Darren, you almost raised your hand to say something. It left you, didn't it? And when it comes back, just interrupt. Okay, okay here we go. Yeah. Some of it. We don't want to give it all. So. I bet before I finally surrender to preach, I surrender to preach a hundred times. Is that right? Oh, I'd go down and I'd pray and I'd say, Lord, I'm going to give it all to you and I'm going to be a preacher. And I'd get up and I'd walk back to my seat. I wouldn't tell the church. <laughs> Would. And this went on, I'm telling you, for years. Everybody that knew me, friends I went to high school with that I was a heathen around said, We knew you was going to make a preacher. I don't know how they knew it, all right? But anyway, I, maybe I'm being too blatant with my testimony tonight, but it's true, all right? I'm not proud of it. I'm just saying that's the way it was. We have to let go of our control because we think we control things. Well, I was good at it. I was good at being a control freak. Sure. I know I was. <laughs> I mean, when you I was willing to be. A, I was willing to be a music minister. I thought I'd have made a great deacon if the Lord would just let me not been a preacher. But I'll tell you all, the night that I finally said yes to the Lord and made it public, I haven't looked back. Uh, I don't claim to be a great preacher. I don't claim to be a good pastor or anything like that. But when I said, yes, Lord, this is what I'll do, for almost 49 years, that's what I've done. And I hope the Lord gives me the strength to do it till the day I die. And I hope it's right here. If y'all don't get rid of me or something. But anyway. That's the challenge. Now, let me see what time it is. Oh yeah, I can start drawing this down to a conclusion. I heard an old preacher named Brother Jerry Jolly say this one time in a revival. He was a great evangelist. I don't know how he got off on this. Maybe that church needed it and he knew it. All right. But he's talking about preachers and the difference people think between the preachers and the people in the pew. And he made the point. I'm serious. Well, we've talked about this, right? we put preachers on this. Oh, yeah. Right? They're way up here. And then there's this man. They've been called to preach. And I'm sure you're going to be held at a pretty high standard for because you do teach the Word, but... We tend to put them up. It's almost like the post sometimes. They've got them up there where they're, you know. And then when they stumble or something happens, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? 
You don't know this. You don't know this, but there used to be a couple from Westville that went to our church, and their daughter was very Catholic. She talked in a real deep voice. Joel would love to be here to hear me say, she called me Father Paul. <laughs> Father Paul, would you come over and talk to, I won't say the names of the people, but yeah, I was Father Paul to some people. Nope. So what's the difference between... Well, he said, he said there's not any financial difference. He said... When you walk up to the grocery store, there's not a special checkout line that says for preachers only. When you pull up to the pump, there's not a pump that says for preachers only. So financially, there's no difference between the preacher and anyone else. But then he went into detail. There's no difference between the preacher. We, we deal with the same temptations that everybody else does. That's what makes us human. All right? Uh, we, we have bad habits. We don't always talk about them. We might not even tell you about them, all right? But we don't we're, have perfect children. We're, no, we don't have perfect children. Good, not Minerva. But when a preacher stumbles, he's, he's held at a different standard. Uh, yeah. Right now, I don't know if y'all are aware of it, the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, I won't even say who it is because I don't, I don't even like to talk about it. But it's come to light, and they did a big study on it. And some very well-known, prominent, named preachers had to leave their churches because they got caught up in sex scandals. It's a shame. But that temptation is there. And I want to tell you all something about that, okay? My old preacher, Dr. Keller, told me, he called me little boy, he said, little boy, there's a bigger target on your back than there is on most men's back because you're a preacher. He said, be on guard. So we think there's a difference. There's not. Listen, I said all that to say this. If God said to me as a preacher, I want you to finally say, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Ain't no difference between me and you. Did you hear me? No difference between me and you. God may not call you to preach. He may not send you somewhere. I mean, I think of Kendra Barnett, little hometown girl that grew up virtually in this church, went away on a summer mission trip, and she dedicated her life to go to Rom Romania. Who would have thunk it? Well, she took her hands off and said, God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And that's what she's doing. No different for her than it is for us. And I, I guarantee you there's going to be people who are going to walk through the gates of heaven and they're not going to be sensed by smoke or anything like that, all right? But they're going to realize that they lost a lot of rewards because they didn't say, Lord, you got all of me. You got all of me. That's why it's a challenge. That's why it's a challenge. And I'll tell you, it's easier to do when you're young than it is when you're old. Anybody got a comment? I just want to thank the church. Um, I put on the on the on the, on the latest prayer list. I think it was uh, Monday, maybe. Anyway, a good friend of mine that I've known for this time. He's ninety. He's ninety-five years old, and, and uh, he's a, he he preached for all of the If he if he had enough prayer, he'd still be preaching. Anyway, back to the short, he, he got to, he got sick and he got pneumonia and they put him in the hospital and um, um, God's not doing it yet. So he but he got he got to come home today, so I just want to make What what's his name again? You know Johnston. All right. Pray for Brother Johnston. I just And God's not church. through with him. No, he's not. <laughs> God wasn't through with David. He made a mistake. People are allowed mistakes. All right, I'm gonna end this. Thank y'all for joining us tonight. Sorry I got